informational program, which I think you're going to find very interesting. I guess we're going to be speaking to the choir tonight, and I'll tell you, get your hymn book out, because we're going to really give you some new words to a lot of things tonight. Without any further ado, I'd like to tell you that we have Sue Hester, our attorney, for over seven here, years. Here, here. And next to her is Brad Paul, who's been with us for two years. He's been my partner and really doing a great job. There's nobody that knows the city really better than he does. And then there's Bob Iverson, who's going to give you, and one of our great volunteers, who's going to give you a presentation visual that I think you will enjoy very much. <coughs> so we're going to start off with both Brad and Sue doing kind of a tandem informational piece. And uh, I hope you got your notebooks out. There will be lots of notes to take. Sue, you want to take it from here? Yes. Oops, here I am, rolling over. Oh, I, no, oh, you oh, can oh, sit down. Oh, right. Oh, that's even better. Wow. I can talk loud enough. Okay. Um, first of all, those of you who submitted comments on an environmental impact report should have received a little notice saying that the answers to them are out. On Christmas Eve, Santa Claus dropped <coughs> into people's mailboxes the comments and responses to the EIR comments. And it comes in two volumes and it came with a CD. Uh, this was released four weeks before the scheduled hearing on the 23rd. And I'm not going to belabor the point, but we will collect information for people who have problems not getting the, either the, EI, the comments and responses paper volume or the CD. That came out on the 23rd. And at the time it came out, a hearing was scheduled for the Planning Commission on the, uh, on, the 20, on the 19th of January. We were assuming that we were going to have a hearing um, in a week, uh, in 10 days from now. Things changed. Things changed, and I know a lot of you saw all of the signs posted around the club. That is a requirement of the law. The law says you have to give three kinds of notice when you have a project of this sort. One, you have to post the site, and that's why all of those huge signs were all over the area. That's notice number one, you have to post. Notice number two is people who own property, which is those of you in the commons, have to get a mailed notice. I sent out emails saying, did you get your notices yet? The third notice is you have to publish a legal ad in the newspaper. And that's where it all fell apart. Um, it was supposed to have been published on the 28th, and if it, it had been published on the 28th, there could have been a hearing at the Planning Commission on the 19th. But the examiner didn't publish the notice. And uh, some of us, we collected the uh, examiners while I was out of town for a couple days, uh, we looked for it. Where's, where's the, we couldn't find the ad. And we notified the planning department was on vacation. They weren't paying attention and no one was paying attention. Last Friday, we notified the city that the ad hadn't been published. And um, I'm not going to use the right word. Uh, the, the something hit the fan. <laughs> Simon Snellgrove's great machinations all fell apart because the plan that they had carefully, carefully, carefully put together was to jam us so that we couldn't deal with the project. I want to remind people that there was a similar jam in November where all of a sudden, out of the blue, we had hearing after hearing after hearing after hearing back to back to back to back. Remember those, those days in the middle of, right before Thanksgiving, we had hearings, three hearings at port, and we had an announcement in the business times that the project had changed. Simon was dealing with us by issuing uh, press exclusives to the business paper that they were eliminating all the tennis courts. 
It wasn't done at an announcement through the city. It was done through the business times and Simon got up and said this was happening at the Port Commission. So they were planning on having a joint planning rec park hearing on Thursday the 19th, which is a week from Thursday, followed by a port approval. The port had scheduled a very, very special, absolutely irregular port commission meeting on Friday the 20th in the morning, followed by a state lands commission approval of the land swap on the 26th. All of that fell apart because A, the examiner didn't publish the ad, and B, we caught it and snitched. So there is what the, the bottom line right now is the absolute earliest the hearing might be is the 9th of February. As of 4 o'clock this afternoon, I didn't have any confirmation on a date because it's fairly complicated when you're trying to coordinate two different commissions, Rec Park and Planning. Rec Park only meets once a month. So where we are at, at that, on this point, is their, their EIR is out, we don't have a hearing date, and we have their entire staff report from the planning department. Because we didn't tell them that they had a problem until after the staff report was out. Very nasty. So we have the documents now that tells us how the staff is analyzing the shadow impacts on Beerman Park and how the environmental impact report is analyzing the project. One of the big change in the project that happened in November was the entire tennis operation was obliterated. They, are, they have a plan for a massive swimming pool complex on the Jackson to Pacific block no tennis courts at all and have a park at the Washington, pardon me, at the Broadway to Pacific block, that little triangle. Um, they have said that there is no opposition to their project except for a bunch of dead-enders, which is what we are, in their opinion. Um, they basically have done a PR operation and a very, very structured presentation to the planning department that only deals with how wonderful their green roof is on their their new pool and what a asset the city is getting by getting the park. We we went through New Ag, we went through the Waterfront Design Advisory Committee. All of this happened in the middle of April, uh, pardon me, April, uh, uh, November. And we really appreciate those of you who showed up on an extraordinarily tight timeline. We didn't have a whole lot of notice. They just started jamming. That is clearly their agenda. We, but we, we've seen their whole card. And we've <coughs> matched it. We matched it in November, and we are in the process of matching it now. And now I'm going to pass it to Brad. I think I'm going to stand up so I can see everybody. Um, Sue's right. They had had this plan to do this PR campaign, and we realized the last piece of that, which some of you were at, were the Planning Commission hearing in December to initiate the rezoning, sort of a pro forma uh, act they have to take a month or so before they can actually have a hearing to approve it. <coughs> Normally, people don't show up. We showed up with a lot of speakers uh, and took quite a bit of time talking about how we thought this was inappropriate, the project itself. But what we did next was we decided to have a discussion on different terms. We asked David Chu, the president of the Board of Supervisors, to schedule a hearing at the Land Use Committee the next week. So it was a Thursday hearing at the, the Planning Commission. We had a Monday hearing at the Board of Supervisors Land Use Committee. And the topic was, should the city raise height limits on the northern waterfront? Because if this project goes forward, it will be the first time that heights have been raised on the northern waterfront since the Fontana Towers, almost 50 years ago. And our premise is, if you're going to do that, if you're going to go against almost 50 years of public policy, shouldn't you have a really good reason? Like building lots of affordable housing for families to keep families in the city, generating lots of revenue for the city, connecting the neighborhoods back to the waterfront. And of course, our premise is that none of those things are true with this project, and we can prove it. So they did say over and over again at hearings that they talked to lots of people, there was lots of support for their project, and the opposition was just a few neighbors. 
who would never be happy with anything. So we decided to start off the Land Use Committee with a few of our dead-enders. We started with Alan Jacobs, the former planning director of the city and county of San Francisco, who is the father of the urban design plan. He talked about why this didn't make any sense. We followed him with Ed Helfeld, the former redevelopment director, who talked again about why this made no sense. We followed that with Louise Rennie, who's here tonight, the former city attorney, who talked about why the green fence was not a problem that we had to deal with, it was a problem that the owners of the property created. Next was Bill Maher, who talked about the need to protect open space from shadows at um, Sue Bearman Park. I spoke in my capacity as former deputy mayor for housing and neighborhoods. After me was uh, Ted Gullickson, the head of the San Francisco Tenants Union, and we had a whole list of people from all over the city who spoke. So I don't think we're going to hear that it's just a few neighbors anymore, hopefully. But we made a number of points at that hearing that I think going forward are what we really want to focus on. One of them is, as I mentioned, this would be the first time you're upzoning the northern waterfront in almost 50 years. Why would you do that? The second is that a partner in this whole enterprise is the owners of Golden Gateway. And what we said, and it's all true, is that 80% of the land for 8 Washington is currently owned by Golden Gateway. Only 20% belongs to the port. It is only the Golden Gateway land that is requesting an upzoning. If the project were approved, the owners of Golden Gateway would get uh, 10, we don't know, 10, 15 million dollars. But here's what we learned from, there's some really interesting information in the comments and responses. What I'm holding up is the finished product if this were ever built. What you see in yellow is what the condos would, where the condos would be, owned by Pacific Waterfront Partners. But what's in pink would be owned at the end of the whole process by the Golden Gateway. It would be the new uh, private club. So they own, I mean, if I'm looking at these, they're not exactly the same size, but they're pretty close. <laughs> so at the land use hearing, the uh, attorney for the developer got really upset that we brought this up. But David Chu, who was sitting there, said, well, wait a minute. Isn't it true that 80% of this land belongs to them and all the other things that we talked about? And she had to agree. Now, we also brought up two other issues. One is that they are, as many of you who live here know, slowly converting the rent controlled apartments that were built with HUD financing to create middle class rental housing. They're converting these to short term vacation rentals and corporate executive suites. And in some cases what they're doing is clearly illegal. In some cases the law is a little fuzzy. But it's still not good if you're trying to keep families in the city. But the second thing hopefully you saw is this is last week's, the current weekly, SF Weekly. And they did a story about how certain property owners, including the owners of the Golden Gateway, are using a loophole in Prop 13 to avoid paying a tremendous amount of property tax. The short version is they don't buy the buildings, they buy less than 50% interest each year in the holding company. And that means that there's never a sale recorded at the assessor's office. So somebody here can do the math, but right now they're paying property taxes based on an appraised value for the whole complex of Golden Gateway, 1,200 units of $64 million. Oh. Now, the, there's, there was a whistleblower report filed a while back in 2008. Um, the State Board of Equalization wrote back and said, well, this isn't exactly a problem. What the article says is this may actually be technically legal. It's not right. It's not ethical. I would argue that it's, it's not quite the moral thing to do, but it may be technically legal. But there are things that the state could do to change that and get back that money. They also talk about one market in here where a, a, a law firm went after the owners for doing the exact same thing. It took almost 20 years, but the city got back $23 million. Um, we mentioned this briefly at the Land Use Committee hearing, but this really substantiates it. So the question we ask is, if they're asking the city to upzone the land, what's the good that comes out of this? And we've gone through all of their arguments and why they're not true. And one of the partners in this deal is destroying middle class housing and, and not paying their fair share of property taxes. It's kind of hard to make an argument for, for supporting this and proving. And finally, you're going to see in a few minutes, Bob Iverson did a great job at that hearing showing how their beautiful drawings don't quite tell an accurate tale of what they're proposing. And I won't spoil his presentation by going into that. But he also showed not one but two alternatives that we proposed for that site that if you read John um, King's review of the project, he said all the good stuff's on the ground floor. He even had a problem with the tower. But our two alternatives have all that good stuff on the ground floor without the towers and without destroying the club. So you will see that in a few minutes. But I want to now turn it over, and, and again, we're going to focus more and more on what's the real solution to connecting the waterfront to these neighborhoods. And we believe there's a really exciting plan, an alternative plan that we can all work on once we get past this bad plan. 
And I'll turn it over now to Sue to talk about where we go next. Uh, this is this is going to be relatively brief. We negotiated getting the comments and responses out early, and we did. I mean, even though it was a Christmassy present from the planning department, that is substantial to have enough time to read this. We made sure we got the staff report so we could review it, and we have basically started going through the process. Telegraph Hill Dwellers it has a, a group of people that are going through the comments and responses because there's a lot of technical stuff that they commented on, that I commented on, that Brad commented on, and others commented on. Technical things, because the whole idea of a comments and responses is to attack the sufficiency of the document, not to just say, we disagree with you, this shows why this shouldn't be approved. So we are still plowing through that document and we'll be doing a substantial uh, presentation brief before the hearing, before the Board of Supervisors hearing. And we are tearing apart all of the, uh, the documents on the planning side. The structure that they have, that they've already shown their hand on, and this is the particularly offensive thing, is the port is planning, was planning, to only give the technical documents on the, land, on the financial deal three days before the hearing, which is pretty damn outrageous. The port has not been known for being a good steward of its, of its property or getting the best deal that it can financially. I sat through years, probably decades of port hearings at the Board of Supervisors listening to people attack the port for its insanity the way in which it deals with it. So they were planning and are still planning as far as we know to drop the technical documents on the land deal which will be complicated three days before the hearing and one of the things we're going to ask Supervisor Chu to do is to, act, to push the port to give them out at a more timely manner because 72 hours in advance for an extraordinarily complicated financial deal is insulting to the public and that is also something that has to be approved by the Board of Supervisors and the Board of Supervisors should be twitchy about that. The State Lands Commission land swap is also something we're dealing with and you're going to see Bob's visuals but we found some really sneaky 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 things the, the land swap is because this is, and I'm just going to do this for a minute because it's technical, they, it, they have to get rid of the public trust to build the housing on the site and that's the seawall lot 351 part. The port is under an obligation, they can't build housing on, on a, a public trust. So they are creating the park at the northern end, which is basically there already. Um, and saying, oh, that's going to be under the public trust and they're going to swap lands. And they've been jiggering boundaries around. And some of us are obsessively going through the land swap and challenging the public benefit of what they plan. Again, that's down the road, that State Lands Commission. Um, it could be on the 26th, but I don't think it's going to be on the 26th. So we have a Planning Commission hearing coming up that's going to deal with the EIR. It's going to be tied to a, a hearing with Rec Park. They have to create a shadow limit budget for Sue Beerman Park. And then they're planning on using all of it for 8 Washington. And then the, the, the project gets approved by planning. Um, so we are jamming on the port, state lands, Rec Park, planning commission, and environmental. Um, and we're all going to do it. I mean, we've already shown we have the ability to do this. I'm just going to take one second to just go over sort of a couple of other things that we're working on. And one is, as you know, there's been a growing coalition opposing this. Besides the four groups that sponsored the A and D plan, which were FOG, Golden Gate Tennis Association, uh, Barbary Coast Neighborhood Association, and Telegraph Hill Dwellers, we have, just to name a few, uh, San Francisco Tomorrow, the San Francisco Neighborhood Network, the Coalition for San Francisco Neighborhoods is opposed to the project, the San Francisco Tenants Union, San Franciscans for Reasonable Growth, 
the Affordable Housing Alliance and many others from all over the city. And that list is growing as we speak. We're getting phone calls from people asking us to come and speak to them so they can take a position. I want to just, and the press, as you know, the Bay Guardian starting late last year started running articles. They will continue to write articles, run articles. The, this article in the weekly was a cover story in the last issue. Uh, you saw a mention of Matir and Ross this morning about the project. I think there's going to be more to come and better articles coming out about why this is such a bad project. Um, I forgot to say one thing, and that is that at the Land Use Committee and at the Planning Commission, we've mentioned what these apartments are going to cost, these condos. And a few of you were at a meeting years ago where the developer said these would be the most expensive condominiums in the history of San Francisco. And I want to thank Fred Allardyce, who's here, for doing this chart that we passed out and explaining it at the Land Use Committee. To buy a $2.5 million condo, you need $625,000 down. You also have to put up, uh, let me find, make sure I get it right, $493,000 in liquid assets, which is three years of mortgage payments in a separate account in case your stock portfolio goes out the window. They want to know that they have the money to pay for that. So you need to come up with $1.1 million cash. And in order for them to make the loan, you have to make $470,000 a year or more. So this isn't housing for the 1%, this is housing for the one half percent. And we've heard that several members of the Board of Supervisors are really interested in the fact that this fits right into that 99% versus 1%. Um, and there's a number, there's a whole bunch of ways you can talk about this, but it's starting to resonate with different people for different reasons. But this is why there's this growing opposition around the city to this. There's a lot of other reasons to be opposed to it, as we talked about earlier. But when people hear how much this costs, and then the developer will say, oh, but we're going to provide some money to build 29 units. But if the owners of the Golden Gateway convert 20 units a year in the three years it takes to build the project, they'll build 29 units and we'll lose 60 units. So that math doesn't work. And so what we're going to be doing is working with people to grow the coalition, uh, get additional press, and I think we've talked about some of the things that you can do. We want to now, I think, Lee, we want to have Bob do his presentation. Yeah, well, do you course. want to speak? Let, let's Bob do it. And Bob, I'll pass this over to you. Okay. And then, then we'll get the audience. Uh, That's it. Wait, wait. It's just yeah. Yeah. I can speak. Here, I can bring this over. That's okay. Oh, how's that? I think it's fine. There, you've got a little bit more stuff. Okay, I'm Bob Iverson. I'm an architect in the city here, and I do work on somewhat similar projects to this. They're more affordable housing type projects, but they are apartments and of equal uh, size and such to, uh, to what's being proposed. Um, uh, Sue and Brad have gone over the legal and procedural aspects of, of how to uh, deal with this project. There are other aspects that perhaps maybe not as effective uh, but I think we need speakers to, to bring these issues up. Charles uh, Duckin is very good at, about the historical aspects of, of the project. Uh, when it was first approved, uh, having this recreational component or community component to the, to the uh, Golden Gateway project. And how that need has not gone away yet we are looking at it being taken away right now, even the, while it's technically legal to do so, uh, from an emotional standpoint, uh, we believe that it's, it's actually, uh, or from a, a practical standpoint for the, for, the, for the city, that to keep a recreational center in, in this area is very important and vital. And along those lines, there are, are many other arguments that can be fashioned to to keep this uh, project and the land in uh, a similar circumstance. And so one way to uh, look at this project and what, what I have been doing is, is taking a look at their proposal, which is very seductive. When you first see it, even John King, you know, who does have a good eye for these items, has, uh, has not really noticed some of the subtleties that, that are not quite uh, there when, when you uh, get a barrage of that in, as Simon Snowgrove has done. And he's been very good at this. I mean, he's been very confident and positive, convincing people that this is a great project and it's going forward. And there are many people out there, and I, hopefully you're not among them, who have come away saying, oh wow, you know, this is a done deal. He's, it is not. As Sue and Brad uh, can very uh, 
well point out to us in, in, other, in other ways that this is not a done deal and we can still stop this. So we need speakers to get up and speak to several issues. Uh, I tried to make a presentation the other day and it's, it was uh, fairly difficult. There's a lot of material. And so I'm going to go through this with you and, and we can use help. Uh, we also, it turns out, have to prove some things, uh, not just by, uh, by actually taking photos of us doing these things. Um, and so, uh, because people seem to not believe. I don't know if we want to uh, um, uh, take a uh, dim down the lights or not, but uh, let's see if we can do. We can do that. Uh, want to turn the lights? Yeah, down just a little bit. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Okay. Can you move to the left? Just do. Okay. Uh, first off, <clears throat> I I see this every day. I go up and down the Embarcadero, and I. Actually, I have a view of this. Uh, this is a the sidewalk on the Embarcadero, and there's the port parking lot. Uh, the you know this is a little more raw than what you'll see from the developer, uh, but here's part of the tennis court one of the tennis courts. Uh, this condition right here, right from the parking lot, the asphalt to there is 16 feet. I went out and measured it, but nobody will believe us on this one. This is a 15 foot uh, setback. Uh, and they say they widened. If you read their documents, they will say they widened this, uh, this, uh, this area to 15 feet. Well, it's actually 16 feet. And so that's just currently. the currently. And, uh, and so through a section, it's 16 feet versus 15. And they have a tall wall here as opposed to uh, um, other spots. Now, a comparative area, if anybody's familiar with this, is Hills Plaza. And the Hills Plaza is down by the bridge to where Gordon Biersch is. That is 15 feet. Now, if you compare these two images, they're not quite the same. And this, their document is, is rife with this throughout. And uh, so, you know, besides actually taking a foot out of the existing condition, they are uh, generously playing with their imagery to make it seem greater than it is. If you go around their whole proposal, and I, I went up and down, by the way, all, up and down the entire Embarcadero, uh, Hills Plaza is the least, uh, it's at 15 feet. The gap in the front is about 18 feet uh, or 20 feet, and it, it does narrow at the very corner at Folsom. But every other section, the uh, Sue Beerman Park, uh, Justin Herman Plaza, all are greater than 15 feet. And uh, so, um, they, they speak highly of their great 15 feet. Then they speak why? highly... Uh, <laughs> why? <laughs> and uh, then we come over and you go around the site and it happens on every part of the site. They have shoehorned this building in here and have not given the city one thing that they say they're giving them. As far as, uh, as you'll see as we go along. Uh, here is the present drum walk. They are taking this fence and moving it back five feet, and then they're saying, look what we're giving you. Well, for one, they're not giving any of this. This already exists. They're giving five feet. And it ends up looking like this. I don't think five feet is going to do that. Then there's an opening into the pool. You can actually see the pool and all that stuff. There's not a pool out there that will allow you to have access to the pool so easily. Uh, there will be a fence there. Um, well, law. It's yeah, by law. Any, there's just liability issues. They will not do that. Here's at the very end. They talk about this this great park that they're doing down here. Well, if you look at it, here's their property. And what they're giving up is half of a tennis court. If you were to come across, and you were to come across, it's half of this tennis court, and then the rest is already there. So they are uh, really playing with throughout the entire site. Here is, here is the walk again and that end. This is what they're giving, the five feet right there. The rest already exists. Now, this is a, a really wonderful little document. All they do is change the word from public to, uh, from uh, pr private to public. As you saw in some of the other diagrams, and I will show you uh, um, 
uh, also along Washington Street. In all honesty, all the tennis courts are further back than anything they talk about in there, except for one, uh, court one, anything in their document, by a long shot, 10, 20 feet in some areas, where their building is much closer than the existing condition. Uh, so, uh, so we do have actually some existing open space. It just happens to be private. And so they're, they, they managed to make this look like, wow, there's only 1,500 square feet here. And we, we're, we're giving the city 29,000. And then you look at this number right here of open space, and it's zero and nine. Well, there's six, it's actually zero and 63,000, which is a, a, a very deceptive method of going through their documentation. The indoor, if you go through each one of these, it's just, it's really uh, difficult to, to trust them on any level. Uh, so as you see, here's the half a tennis court that comes back. Here's the five feet that they're going to give. Then they're also going to give this back. And this is part of that land swap that uh, Sue was speaking about. And here is what they need to trade off. And part of what they're giving back is... Well, they're giving this back, this little portion right here, uh, back to the port who already owned part of it. But they're going to give this part right here of the club to, to, the, uh, to the city. And this portion right here is an unbuildable easement. So they can't build there anyway. So what they're doing is... Uh, There's a sewer line right underneath it. Yeah, it's a, it's a utility easement. A huge sewer line. Through there. And it's, it, historically, it makes sense. I mean, there used to be a street there for the, when the warehouses were there. And, uh, but um, so what they're doing is, you know, here's, this is a, a fairly large chunk of land that they're not, they, that's no longer there. They're actually along in, uh, Washington Street. They're taking away the parking spaces and making it seem like the street is very wide there. It's sort of like the pocket parks that are going up around the city, only they're doing it permanently for their building. And so they get that and they say, look how wide our streets are. Well, they just took away uh, some parking spaces that people could use for short-term things and, uh, uh, and, and forcing people to go down below their building and, and spend a half an hour of, of time uh, using their, their parking structure. So, uh, so they're... In their land swap, they're giving away an unbuildable easement. They're cleverly making this look like this giant park when they're really just giving over this little bit, five feet along here, and then a little tiny bit right here that they're giving back to the city. And that's their swap. Yet, if you read their document, you would think this is the, <coughs> one of the best open spaces, you'll, you know, and, and a very, uh, very generous set of streetscapes going around. But it is as tight as the city will let them do it. Uh, so they're not really doing what they, how they speak of it. The uh, other end of that is, um, <coughs> come on here, is they had uh, originally, so if we go through and, 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 and analyze their documents, we can, we can find quite a bit of fault and exaggeration. Uh, I think the other side of that is the planning department always speaks of Chicago and the Millennium Mile, or the, uh, uh, the, not the Millennium Park and the, and the Miracle Mile, and how great it is and how we want this to end up like that. Well, I don't see making tight streets and, and uh, very, very tiny parks out of, stuff, out of items that already exist there as creating either the Miracle Mile or the uh, Millennium Park. They're just not there, and this building, I would argue, is not going to get us there. It is just housing for very wealthy people. It is inefficient. That's the other thing that the, uh, the developer will always say, is this is what we have right now, the tennis courts, is very inefficient. And yet, 145 units for, for people who are, half of them maybe won't be here that often, is is equally inefficient, if not more so. And we have quite a few people using this club. And you take away the uh, the uh, kids camp and all the tennis use, and you're talking a lot less use for middle income people as opposed to the 145 units they're planning on proposing there. Uh, so um, so here's their present proposal, 
as, as you see, there are no tennis courts. What's left is this little open area right here. That's the open area that they talk about how great their open space. If you remember that chart, chart was earlier, they compared open space between the existing club and, and now. Well, this is the open space right here. It's not much. And, and uh, uh, there's, okay, they do have some within, the, within here, but that's private. And apparently you have a view to it. This was their proposal in uh, 2006. They actually uh, kept six courts they were trying to do. He's been somewhat mean to us, too. Every time we complain, he comes back with less courts. <laughs> uh, so, and he had four in between. He had another proposal with four. So besides going at his project on an open space and streetscape standpoint, we felt we needed to provide some pro uh, alternatives for them. Asian Neighborhood Design did a wonderful project a couple years ago. And uh, in uh, four years ago, five years ago, um, uh, four years ago almost exactly, is just in November, we sat down with the developer and came up and showed him, look, you can keep this and still get some buildings along here if you want a street face and, and create something along the, along the uh, Embarcadero, which the city seems to like, but I, I think, as you'll see, I like Asian neighborhood design idea better. Um, but we still keep everything here, the nine tennis courts, etc. Um, and the pool. Um, they also talk about in their alternative, so here's, here's our, our alternative in 2007, here's their present one. They have retail, retail, retails all along the orange. Well, this proposal here had retail, 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 uh, all around it. You can get the same thing and keep the facility here. And so it's not like they can't, the city can't get what they want. Here is the what we showed them four years ago and this is what they have today I you know granted there's this more developed they've you know I did this in uh, two weekends or something but uh, this is that unbuildable easement right down here here's the here's the uh, 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 green roof on the uh, fitness center well here's a fitness center that I had over on this side and then this was a hotel which is actually you don't have to change the rules of the uh, uh, port property because they can put hotels on, on port property. They cannot put residential uh, um, complexes on port property. Okay, so you can achieve these things. Then you go to the Washington Street side and here's a little outdoor eating area. Here's a little outdoor eating area. Here is a big tall building. And I might add that they are asking for nine changes in the zoning code, I believe. Is that right, Sue? Oh, yes, at least. Nine changes in the zoning code to make this happen. This proposal has none. So, uh, and, and you do a, a like use of the port. So, you don't need to do this, this nine, uh, 13 story or 12 story building that they're trying to get proposed. And he will get whatever he can, get, whatever he can take. Every inch of sidewalk, every, every uh, foot of height he can get. So, uh, Asian Neighborhood Design came back and had a wonderful little idea of, uh, and they, they actually did some uh, monetary uh, analysis of their project as well. And they proposed a much smaller uh, facility along the, along the waterfront, along the Embarcadero, and I think that is, would be much more in keeping with Chicago's Miracle Mile and Millennium Park uh, to, to leave some open space along that edge and they think just a little building that maybe would be uh, definitely service uh, the tourism and the people of the city, say a, a bike uh, storage in this particular case. Um, and, uh, you know, this was, this was, if we really wanted to gussy it up, we could put something over the tennis courts, such as uh, these are covered courts up at the University of Oregon, and the previous diagrams had other items. So. Uh, once again, Asian Neighborhood Design, a few years back, uh, two years back, had, had just a wonderful little process and, and came up with, it was, it was a, a, a grander scheme about the whole area, which I do think uh, needs to be considered if we are to become the Miracle Mile and not just another condo at the end of this Sue Beerman Park and Justin Herman Plaza with the hotel, Vital, being the other end. It, it's not looking very uh, promising to be Chicago's waterfront at that point. Um, this is our original development right here. 
and you can see that they've this is as you know Charles Duncan would say is is this need has not gone away for the uh, open space requirements. That's that was that's there. the map from the if you go to the redevelopment site that is the map for Golden Gateway that blue green thing is all open space on the redevelopment plan. It's there today if you go to the redevelopment site. That's their green. That's Sydney Walton Square, the tennis club, and Beerman Park, and the stuff straddling the Alcoa building. Green, kind of blue green on this. And one of the things that they talk about here is the connection into the rest of the city, Broadway and Washington. Uh, the developer plays up connecting Jackson Street. I think it still is more important to develop Washington into something greater than it is and Broadway into something greater than it is uh, and not worry about Jackson so much. Uh, and we should definitely pull that off. I also think there's a possibility to develop Front Street into something that's uh, a good crossover since there are plenty of empty spaces still along there. Uh, and inboard is where maybe most of the parking should go. If you really want to have a nice uh, uh, waterfront, I don't think we should be dragging all our cars here. And that's 430, 400 car parking garage right there, right on there. And it's, uh, it will be very crowded along here to do 400. And we have a lot of parking in inboard of, of this area. So, um, so we have the proposed versus the possible. And I think what we need to uh, um, to get at is is hopefully for everybody to realize that there's it took 25 years to do Yerba Buena uh, Gardens and Center and this is this is perhaps I you know it, from a natural aspect it's it's a much more significant spot uh, Yerba Buena Center turned out quite well uh, Yerba Buena Gardens. But uh, this should deserve a little more thought than it's getting. And, and I think from my standpoint, if we can uh, sh show that there's <coughs> other alternatives that are more viable and better and argue against this project and, and, and point out some of the problems with it that have been happening uh, it, that people don't notice uh, through all the glitz and the, and the fairly strong marketing uh, items that he's done lately. Uh, I think we just need to overcome those items and, and we do stand a chance to stop this and, and get something good to happen along the waterfront. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Sue, Brad. Bob is one of our can I have volunteers. Back responses back? And I would like, to, can we turn the lights back on a little bit, please? Can I add one more item? I, I might want to add, we just need, we need people to get up and speak to these issues and and be at the meetings and and actually help me out with with some of these points. I cannot do that in three minutes. You, you've taken the words right out of my mouth. Okay. <laughs> uh, this is the kind of team we have, and now it, we'd like to get some response and questions, I'm sure, from the audience. Uh, why don't we, t you're, you're Mr. Bankovich, I think? <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Uh, can you have, you, I'll let you start off, um, since you're my neighbor. Okay. When I was over at the club this afternoon, I noticed that there was uh, a whole bunch of business cards from Matthew Stevens and Victor Wu and it says here, for questions regarding the 8 Washington development in Western Athletic Clubs, please contact us. Do you know why WAC is supporting Snellgrove in this project? Somebody like to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I mean, yeah, the phone, the phone. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, at the last hearing, at, uh, it was the, the Planning Commission hearing for initiating the rezoning. Uh, one of the gentlemen from WAC came and said, I can't remember his exact words, but he said something like, we would be happy to operate the new club. But I think to be fair, they're on a month-to-month -month lease. So they cannot oppose this project. But I have to believe that shutting this club down for three years, which is how long it's going to take, is not in their best interest. I would guess, and I can't speak for them, they would be delighted if this project went away, and there was some way to fix the ugly green fence, which the owners could do tomorrow and should do tomorrow. They created it, 
And as several people said at the last hearing, they are maintaining it as an ugly green fence as a justification for this project. But I don't think they would be hurt at all if this project went away. I think they would be delighted to work with the community. But I think you raise a bigger issue, which is one of the concerns people have out there, it is a fear, is that if we kill this project, it'll just be an ugly parking lot, an ugly green fence for another 20 years. And I think the best answer is that some of you in this room have fought this now four times, and you're getting tired of it. I've only fought it once, and I'm getting tired of it. <laughs> so as part of our plan, the A and D plan, there is an alternative not just for this site, but for all the seawall lots. And I think if this project goes away, and it's really a big distraction right now, you'll get the four groups, including Telegraph Hill Dwellers, to sit down with a lot of the large property owners in the neighborhood, even the owners of Golden Gateway, and say, let's fix this once and for all. Not with a project that has nothing to offer the city, but for the exciting project that Bob talked about that's a transit center, bike center, retail center. It's a transit center for the city on the waterfront. and has a spacious Embarcadero that's not shadowed by this project. I love the fact that when they show their rendering, the towers in the back are hidden by fog. You can almost not see them. Right. They at, the, at the Newag meeting, they had this huge mural, and you can almost imagine that the 140-foot tower is going away because there's so much fog between you and them. There's some really good, and we'll show some stuff at the next hearings that show clearly what those buildings are going to look like. But I think the answer is that I think they would be a willing partner in trying to figure out how to solve this problem. First, we've got to get rid of this project, which is a big problem. And then I think there is a sort of perfect storm of interest and alignment to fix this once and for all. And the other incentive for this is the America's Cup. The city needs to figure out a way to make the waterfront work better. So I wouldn't pick on them too much, but you might want to let them know that you're not happy about um, this going away. And I think they are, in their hearts, equally concerned about what will happen if this project goes forward. Could someone turn Thank the lights you. back up? Uh, I think it's out. Yeah. They are back up? Yes. Oh, I think No, they're not. They're not back up. No, they're not back up. No. Uh, Paul? Yeah, my question is about the process. You're asking us to help you, and I think most people here would be very happy to do so. But please keep us informed about the process. What has to happen when, who has to be where, when? <laughs> Let me know. answer that. We, ha we have caused such chaos, they don't know which end is up. And my job, more than anybody's, is to stay on top of all of these pieces. It's like my three days, three times a day phone calls. I literally am doing that, and no, I'm not exaggerating. They don't have a date yet for the Planning Commission Rep Park hearing. Believe me, as soon as we know it, we will tell you. Generically, the process is going to be a double hearing of rec park and planning. That's the way they operate because they have to change the shadow allocation for Beerman Park. And they, the planning department has come up with a model of having these massive, hear massive panels where you have uh, two commissions up there. There will be a hearing, a joint hearing. There will be a port hearing. Hopefully it will not be the following day. <laughs> and we will be asking uh, through Supervisor Chu, I hope, the port to say, you're not going to get these documents three days in advance, which is their current proposal. We are going to counter jam the port to not do this back to back and give their documents out. We don't have any information on this other than everything is way up in the air. So, believe me, Lee is very good about sending out alerts. The minute we have any data, we will tell you. We know that there will be, okay, there's also going to be an appeal of the environmental impact. Assuming the, assuming the Planning Commission is so silly as to certify the EIR. Appeals are taken to the Board of Supervisors. Assuming that the port is, is stupid enough to approve the project, the port decision does not end at the Port Commission. Port leases go to the Board of Supervisors automatically. Rezonings go to the Board of Supervisors automatically. Conditional uses, plan unit developments are appealed to the Board of Supervisors. So. Even if they get it through the Port Commission and the Planning Commission and the Rec Park Commission, and we're going to do our best to make sure that doesn't happen, it goes to the Board of Supervisors on five other issues. Two of them are appeals. Three of them are things that they have to do. So it's a very complex process. 
And then there's state lands. Gavin Newsom is the chair of state lands. We are going to be dealing with Gavin Newsom. Um, so all of that is, is going on. And we will tell you when we know. What you need to understand is there should be a round of applause because there isn't a hearing on the 19th and the 20th and the 26th. Thank you, Sue. Uh, did you get all that down, Paul? <laughs> I, I'm going to test you in about five minutes. Okay, the look. gentleman in the back there, we, uh, Reinhardt. This is Reinhardt Lucky. I'm a civil engineer, structural engineer, and my question is: It appears from the press, uh, from what you can see, that some politics is already uh, in, in place. Uh, like I, I'm sure Simon is doing a lot of. Uh, Marketing, propaganda, people are Campaign money's involved. Uh, there's there's uh, benefits for certain people. And I wonder if I saw what, what's the what's the temperature of the board of supervisors? Because I think it's gonna end up in your lap. Uh, <laughs> guess what? <laughs> surprise surprise guess. So first of all, Happy New Year's, everyone. And uh, my apologies, I was a little late today. Uh, I was actually chairing the board meeting since 2 o'clock, and we actually had another EIR appeal uh, that just let out uh, a few minutes before I got on my bike and came over here. But thank you all for working together. I really want to thank Lee and Sue and Brad and all of you here at FOG for really helping to raise these issues and raise some visibility on a project that uh, I think needs a lot of work. Now, to directly answer your question, um, it's been a little unclear what exactly has been happening as far as politics because they're not informing me. And this, uh, you know, my colleagues are vaguely aware that there's a project coming down that is going to be a really big deal. I think my sense of things in my conversations is that uh, they know that this is not a project that I uh, feel good about right now. And in fact, I mean, they're, they're very aware that uh, how disappointed I was in the planning department's process that did not result in, a, I think, a project that made sense for the community. So from our perspective, my office's perspective, there really has just been radio silence. And during that time, the various departments in the city are moving very, very quickly to hide the ball. Uh, and this is why Sue and Brad and others and, and our office have been really trying to do what we can to understand what's going on. But this gets to Lee's point of how important it is for all of us collectively to be speaking uh, about the issues that we all have with this project. And not just folks in this room, uh, but we have to make sure that I think that there are many, many diverse voices that represent all of San Francisco in different parts of the district, in different parts of the city, talking about this. So for example, uh, whether it's my colleague Malia Cohen, who's just hearing about this for the first time, Scott Wiener, uh, Jane Kim, uh, my newest colleague, Christina Olaghi, these are all individuals who I think it's fair to say will be potential swing votes in this project. And I am limited in how much I can lobby them under the Brown Act, but you all can be talking to them and your friends can be talking to them, framing the issues and letting them know that this is not just about some beautiful marketing materials. There are some very real neighborhood issues, some traffic issues, um, significant planning issues, uh, significant recreation issues, and from my perspective, a significant collision with a project that we all support, which is the America's Cup, and what impact this could have on that. So uh, it is really important for everyone to be working together uh, in coordination with